So the Buddha always taught, let me say that again. The Buddha consistently taught one meditation method throughout his career, despite all the things that have developed um, since then and attributed to so-called Buddhist meditation, etc. cetera. Um, and it always, the meditation method that he taught always included two components, shamatha or the something that we do to develop a calm and peaceful mind or tranquility. That's what shamatha means. And vipassana, and meaning insight, but a very specific insight into three marks of existence. And that insight isn't necessarily to occur on our cushions, although it might. This insight into the three marks of existence, into the impermanence of all things, and misunderstanding of what constitutes a self or anatta, and the resulting dukkha from a misunderstanding of the first two, um, is the very specific insight that the Buddha teaches. In other words, it's not just some generalized insight into pick a subject, which is often how it's taught. Uh, and then you take that, whatever subject you decide to gain insight in, you bring it to your meditation cushion, and that's your meditation practice. Well, that's not meditation, that's just contemplation. And when you understand that the Buddha teaches meditation uh, primarily for deepening concentration, uh, you understand that contemplation is, is not going to develop that. And that's not to say we shouldn't use a quiet mind to contemplate certain subjects, but not as a substitute for shamatha vipassana meditation. And the word that the Buddha often used to describe meditation is jhana. In other words, he would say, um, go find the root of a tree or an empty hut and do jhana, meaning go find a secluded place and do something that increases jhana, increases concentration. So jhana means uh, meditative absorption. And the Buddha teaches that there's four levels um, but even that can be confusing. The, the, the delineation between each level is very subtle, even though we can notice going from one level to another. Uh, but that, and again, the reason why I'm saying this is we shouldn't get fixated on, oh, I'm on a, am I in level one or two or three or four? It's simply to acknowledge that meditation is a practice of ever deepening concentration or ever deepening meditative absorption. And again, that's what my next six or seven or eight talks will be specifically on that. In this sutta, uh, it's one of the relatively rare suttas where the Buddha is not teaching it directly himself. This is being taught by Ananda, who is the Buddha's uh, cousin and his attendant uh, throughout most of his teaching career. And, and every, every teaching the Buddha gave for the last 25 years of his life. Uh, and this is specifically on the importance of developing tranquility and insight as as a complete meditation practice. Nanda says, friends, whoever achieves the unbound state, meaning awakening or free of bondage to sensual desires, free of clinging to wrong views, does so by means of one of four paths. And even that is a little bit misunderstand, misleading. Uh, it, it's not really a, a different path, whether it's going to be a, tran a tranquility path or a or a insight path. It's really one path with different situational applications of tranquility and insight. And I'll explain that in just a minute. When one has developed insight, meaning Vipassana, preceded by tranquility or shamatha, their path is born. They follow that path, the eightfold path, develop the path, the path and pursue the path. As they develop the path, their shackles are abandoned and their obsessions destroyed. They are unbound or awakened. When one has developed tranquility preceded by insight, their path is born. They follow that path, the eightfold path, develop the path and pursue the path. As they develop the path, their shackles are abandoned and their obsessions destroyed. They are unbound or awakened. So the, the Ananda is teaching that whether, and he's not teaching that we can choose either to practice insight first and then tranquility or, or shamatha or the other way around. It's just at different times in our practice, it may seem like insight is what's driving our practice. In other times, it's a calm and peaceful mind that we're more aware of. But they're not distinct paths. 
and they all are rooted in, as Ananda teaches, they're all rooted in the Eightfold Path. And that's an important point to the, the um, much of modern Buddhism has gone to the extreme view of either dismissing meditation almost entirely or creating a, a so-called Buddhist practice only on meditation. Of course, they're both extreme views that do not then include the entire Eightfold Path. The Buddha taught meditation and deepening concentration as the foundation for a well-integrated but complete Eightfold Path. Ananda continues, when one has developed tranquility in tandem with insight, their path is born. They follow that path, the Eightfold Path, develop the path and pursue the path. As they develop the path, their shackles are abandoned and their obsessions are destroyed. They are unbound or awakened. When one's mind has its restlessness, meaning doubt and confusion, well under control, their mind grows steady inwardly, meaning tranquility. Their mind goes steady, grows steady inwardly and settles down. Their mind becomes unified, and unified with what? Unified with their body. That's the, the ultimate goal of the Buddhist teaching is to, is to unite the mind in the body moment by moment with life as life occurs. Uh, the, the opposite of that would be a distracted mind, wouldn't it? And a distracted mind, a mind that is always obsessed with self-referential views, whether it's recognized or not, is always focused outside of the body past or future, what it's going to get, what it hopes to avoid. Those are all objectified outside of the body. A truly awakened human being with their mind united in their body is calm. And the reason why is because their mind is united in their, in their body. There's nothing provoking them to leave their body, even if it's just a momentary thought, which it usually isn't, or a constant stream of consciousness rooted in ignorance. That means that we're not living our lives. And all stress arises from simply not being present with life as life occurs, as it unfolds. And the reason I say it that way is we can also, and there's a modern push to be only in the present moment and always keep yourself in the present moment. Well, the present moment is a myth as far as human beings are concerned. We cannot, our minds aren't quick enough to only be in the present moment. But the idea is to simply be in our bodies as our life unfolds and be present with what's unfolding. And so each and every moment we are in the present moment without being obsessively focused on, am I in the present moment? It's simply a consequence of being awakened. Their mind becomes unified and well concentrated with, which leads to insight. As they develop the path, their shackles are abandoned and their obsessions destroyed. They are unbound and awaken. Friends, whoever achieves the unbound state, meaning awaken, free of bondage to sense desires, free of, of clinging to views rooted in ignorance of four noble truths, does so by means of one of these paths. That's the end of the short sutta. Thank you for listening. Um, it is a simple and direct sutta, isn't it? And when you, um, when you follow the advice of Ananda, it keeps our meditation practice very simple, doesn't it? It keeps us focused on why we're doing it. It's not for any other reason uh, except to deepen our concentration, develop a calm and peaceful mind, and gain insight. Now, you can't take this sutta or any other sutta out of the context of the overall teachings of the Buddha because you'll, if you just follow this sutta, you wouldn't understand what we're to gain insight into, would you? In fact, you really wouldn't understand what the Buddha means by a common peaceful mind. A common peaceful mind is a mind that is free of anything that would cling one to the ignorance of those three marks of existence. And the instructions here are very clear. We achieve this by integrating a proper or right meditation within the framework of the Eightfold Path. The Buddha, the Ananda repeats that in each section of the sutta doesn't it? well again it's a complete path that includes right meditation so um any questions on this sutta and then we'll just go around the room let me just see any anybody has a question online no i don't know if the chat window is working but a few folks have joined us isabel so good to see you yeah. have you how's your practice been it's been kind it's been well wonderful I've, I've been integrating 
integrating, like developing a lot of like, my meditation practice, speaking of I'm okay, I'm not meditating every single day, but I, I don't know, I feel that I've been like really integrating the Eightfold Path and like that aspect of my practice. Outstanding. Um, I feel that I have like committed to really developing my practice, so that maybe that's why, I don't know, <laughs> it's just there's something that's been different since I started coming here. That's great. Yeah. Just really enjoyed this sutta because I, I feel like that's, as always, like the sutta just like, like reminds me or points out something that it's, that's like, I don't know, it goes hand in hand with what I've been working on. So. And do you see how this, this applies in a very practical way to meditation? Yeah. Especially to Martha Vipassana oh. meditation. Yeah, because I was talking with my, um, the other night I was talking with my roommate and I told her, um, cause she's an NA and she was talking to me about some stuff and I was like, you know, you should really like, uh, try meditation. I think you should try meditation and like, yeah. within, and I started talking to her and she knows that I come here and like what I've been studying and, you know, I said, I had this. I was like, it's been helping me, like within the context of the eightfold, uh, eightfold path, is it's really been helping me to exist in a world of chaos. Yeah. And that what I do when I meditate, like what's going on in here, is like relating to how I exist in, or like what's going on around. I don't know. I just had this. It's like I'm like walking like a breath, like and when I'm really am concentrated that I, for, I don't know, certain days, it, it's just, I feel like I'm like moving breath or something, you know, That's <laughs> I don't great. know, it's, and I don't think too much on it, but it was just like in that moment we were talking about it, it just kind of, yeah, so, I don't know. That's <laughs> great. Thank you, Isabel. The, uh, well, at first, you, your friend should know, if they don't already, that meditation is such an important part of recovery. Forget about Buddhist meditation, but meditation is there for a reason, you yeah. know, and, and, she, uh, and you know, it's the same, like she says, like, oh, it's just so hard for me to constant, like to get into that space. And I was like, we don't have to do it for like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. It's like just sitting for a minute. Yeah. You start like, like I taught, teach, taught you and taught every teach everybody else to start with a few minutes. And, but honestly, a meditation just to, just to sit without any other context or framework is very, very difficult. You know, even even those of us that have this practice, it's difficult at times, especially to begin with it. So the, the framework of the Eightfold Path supports an ever-deepening meditation practice, and that's so important. Frank? I think it's really difficult in the beginning when you talk about medita meditation, people don't understand or they think that meditation, and I certainly did, when I first started, is to escape your yep. thoughts, yep. escape feelings, a place to run to, to kind of get away from what's happening out there. And and I think it's a really cool part of the pad when you, once you start and you realize that thoughts are a part of meditation and as they arise and you refocus on the breath, they pass away. Yep. And, and it's just like it builds a little bit at a time. And then the thoughts and the feelings and even sensations in the body. Um, just interesting. Like I remember when I first started, I would get these itches and twitches and whatever was going on when I was trying to sit quiet for five or 10 minutes and it would start to make me angry. Like, like every, how come every time I want to sit down and meditate, I get like an itch or, you know, something's going on where it's like distracting me. And then I think I heard you say, um, that, ha that generally happens in the beginning. Uh, I don't know if it was part of the ego personality or whatever, but, um, don't pay attention to it. Every time it comes up, acknowledge it and return to the breath. That's it. And then before I know it, that meditative, um, space got larger and larger and the time got longer and longer. And, um, 
none of those things started. And I guess that's what the jhanas are. Like you yeah. were talking before, you get to different levels, and and sometimes I feel like I regress, um, especially in the afternoon meditation and when I have a busy day. Yeah. Um, I'm mentally exhausted, and when I close my eyes, my body wants to go to sleep. Yeah. So and that sounds good before I do that. Yeah, but that that's just as an important time to meditate as your morning sit, isn't it? And you're describing the four foundations of mindfulness in a, in a very practical way. The Buddha never never taught that meditation is to develop a trance-like state. And this sutta speaks specifically to why. Because if we're sitting in a trance, there's no opportunity for insight, is there? We're just... Well, I don't even know how to describe. I could. I've learned meditation techniques, and I could teach teach all of you in a few minutes. And it's really not teaching; it's more suggesting to go into a state where it doesn't seem like you're thinking. And I don't teach it for a lot of reasons. One is that there's no opportunity for insight. One is, it, to me, then it's just another distraction. It's simply not something that the Buddha taught. He he taught meditation so that we can deepen concentration, which means that we're not distracted by our own thoughts. But it doesn't mean we don't have any. Yeah, and I think even like after meditating for three years, there are some days I'll sit in meditation, especially in the afternoon, where from the word go, it's time to meditate. It's really hard for me to find a breath sometimes because mm -hmm. there's so much going on in my mind where um, it, it's almost, it's a, the whole thing is distracting. But I just sit there and try to find the breath and cut through all that. Yeah. Um, and I just have to accept it for what it is and, and appreciate the time on the cushion. And over time, you've noticed a, a deepening, deepening jhana, deepening concentration. Off the cushion. Yeah. yeah and that's the practical off. application of it, isn't it? Yeah. And the, you were describing that too, Isabel, you know, deepening concentration. That's it, it's. That's how it should be, and it's also important to recognize it when it's occurring. On retreat, I talk more about this on retreat than I do here, simply because of the context. But as we deepen our Dhamma practice, it's important to recognize what's no longer present as it is to recognize what's developing, meaning you know, we're not, not nearly as distracted as we were prior. You know? And that, that just helps invigorate our practice, too. Well, I'll get back to you, Frank. I want to hear what Nash has to say. Good to see you, my friend. I'm sorry to disappoint. I don't have much to say. Oh, I'm just glad you're here. Me too. Your practice is going well? Uh, no. I shouldn't have asked. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just having a week, and I'm having a really hard time discerning what, I, what like, I'm contributing to my um, stress and what is what is real i guess and then i get it's just a, a big mess of messy feeling so trying to figure it out and you understand that that's that this is an all part of impermanence and part of the first noble truth too dukkha it's just part of having a human life you're you're not you're not doing anything wrong you know it's not that there's something wrong with nash it's just it's just another temporary state that um, don't try to figure it out too much. Really, the best thing to do is just continue with your Dhamma practice uh, in as wholehearted a fashion as you can. And it'll, it'll simply clear up. And it's just like that sometimes. It, and, you know, you might, if you, if you think of it, you could go on the, uh, on the website and look up hindrances and just look at that. I think you'll find some relevance there. It's something that the Buddha taught these five hindrances. That if he didn't teach it, he taught it because it's common for all of us to go through that. And we'll, I think it'll bring you some insight into what's going on right now. Well, I'm glad you made it tonight. Thank you, Frank. Good to see you. Good to be here. Good to see Nash and Isabella. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to take away tonight from this um, teaching, you know, and just to talk about what I was mentioned something about the Shamatha Vipassana meditation. Um, I think 
think that there's a natural um, blending of mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness with the start of Shamatha, Kasha. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I see it as the same anymore. Yeah. And um, mindfulness, um, uh, the whole process kind of helps me throughout the day. I'm not only creating space and dealing with things like Nash is talking about, um, how, how I contribute to my own uh, pain and suffering, confusion, delusion, um, greed, passion, all those fires, the three fires um, and the hindrances that you were just talking about that naturally occur when, when I kind of uh, get wrapped up in those feelings. Hmm. I like what you, your suggestion was don't really pay too much attention to that because that really is the truth because they're so impermanent they they rise and they pass away and when I just recognize it as part of the five clinging aggregates just basically those five physical senses that feed that sixth sense base yeah. and the conscious mind that that's what happens that that's a natural phenomenon that happens when we're clinging and craving onto things yeah. and looking for answers and looking for stuff. It's just simple enough for me to recognize that I'm in wrong view and to not even abandon it, but just recognize what right view is. And that is knowledge of stress, uh, knowledge of the origination of stress, stress, knowledge with regard to the cessation of stress and then knowledge uh, with the path leading to that. And it all starts with right view and then right intention and it's pretty cool how it is a, another spoke in the wheel, and it just keeps that that um, wheel that connects the mind and the body, and it takes that mind that's focused outwardly and brings it back here, where it's nice and calm and peaceful. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then, and then I forget about all that stuff. What or, or what caught me up in the beginning? I forget about it, and that and it's cool that that's the impermanence of it. It just it falls away. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I'm even making any sense. I'm having a kind of tired, a tired day and week myself. And um, it was, a, you know, the, the long drive up here is worth it for me to, ch to take something away. Like I was just going to say, um, when you said that either whether it's tranquility preceded by insight or insight preceded by tranquility, um, as long as they're practiced in tandem, um, sometimes the calm first gives rise to insight. Yeah. And sometimes the insight produces the calmness. Yeah. That's the point of the sutta. It's not that there's it, it, probably the use of the word path. And again, that's a translation. Um, and I was actually thinking tonight that I might try to find a better word because it's a, you know, it's a translation from the original Pali. Um, it, it's all one. Shamatha Vipassana is the method. The instructions are the beginning of the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness. And then in the rest of the Sutta, the Buddha teaches in that Sutta, in the Anapanasati Sutta, what to do with a, with a mind that is well concentrated. You develop the rest of the path from that, um, and it and it's just that way. And you, you, Nash didn't talk about this to me. Both you and I'm sorry, both you and Isabel talked about it. And that's that's the eightfold path. That's it. It's just, um, and when you can understand it that way, you stop grasping after other types of practices. You don't need to adapt or accommodate or embellish it anyway. You avoid getting into rites and rituals as part of your practice and just develop the eightfold path. And it's simple, it's direct, it's pure, and it works immediately. You know? yeah. And it works all the time. As the Buddha said, it's a timeless path, mean, meaning that it's always effective every time we pick it up. You know? I think it's cool that Nash was able to see that he is caught up in something yeah. and that he feels confused or deluded. Like whatever's going on in the mind, like he can already see it. You know yeah. I mean? and, and just a little bit of time spent on the cushion, five minutes uh, in the morning, five minutes in the afternoon creates, like for me, I was so fortunate 
just those five minutes in the very beginning for the first couple months gave me so much um, a little bit of time. Oh yeah, again, that's that's the way to start. And, and Nast, do you recognize that 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 the insight you've developed so far is is quite profound, and it allows you to see things as you just described it. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there is a there is a lot of comfort in that, and I'm realizing that I am in some way, even if my way of contributing to it is simply just by thinking about it so much. Um, I am, you know contributing to to how I feel and there is a there is there is peace in that. Yeah. Good. That's what the path is there for, all right. Yeah. The evil path. That's the, to say like when I'm feeling that way, to say, hey, I'm in wrong I must be in wrong view. Yeah. Right. And then what what does it say when I when I'm in wrong view? Let me see what it says. Oh, it says uh abandon wrong view and remain in right view. Yeah. Well what is right view? And then you know what I mean? And then right view is just simply this. And then let me move on to the next one because I'm already starting to feel better. You know yeah. I mean? And it's yeah. like, oh, this one says Aban abandon and remain in right, right view, um, remain harmless, renunciation, uh, you know, no ill will. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I won't act out and then remain in right speech. Okay, so I won't, I won't say something to somebody that I feel like saying something to, even if it's to myself. Yep. And then I'll take some right action and I'm going to go sit on the cushion for five minutes and produce a little bit more. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. just a nice instructional it, manual. It's like things to do, not not to do. Yeah, yeah that's right. And so you explained in a, in, a, in a very practical way, what I say is be gentle with yourself. It means to be mindful of your ill will towards others, but also towards yourself, which often manifests as wrong speech. You know, we're, we're, we're just too hard on ourselves. Because what we were talking about when we came here, when I came here tonight was that part of the practice that I think probably a lot of people get discouraged, and I know I did, but I kept pushing through it, is when you're caught up in that, it feels really tough and really painful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I know, I don't know about anybody else, but when I feel that way, I want to fix myself with a drink or a drug or something else. Yeah. Um, or with whatever else external is going to fix me. Any and, distraction will do. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't need fixing. All I need is understanding. Yeah. Self-referential views, especially when we're stuck in it, they're always painful. Well, we, and that's why we're always seeking distraction. because Self-loathing. Yeah, self-loathing is, is the underlying, we were talking about this earlier, you know, the underlying thing of a, the underlying characteristic of a self-referential ego personality is self-loathing. Why? Because you're never good enough for yourself. I mean, that was it for me. And I bet you, if you look at yourselves, you would think that way. But then you think about how ridiculous that thought is, no matter what's going on in your life, that you're not good enough. You're all you got. You know, it, it can't it can't be a true and realistic thought, could it be? It just can't. But yet, most of us think that way, and Not that we so. need to do something or get something. You know, usually it's an outer expression of that. That if we if we can cloak ourselves in whatever we think success might be and show it to everyone, then nobody's going to notice what's wrong. Well, there's no way to satisfy that. That that is dukkha. That's something. That's a a self rooted in wrong views, rather than understanding. We're simply human beings having a human life. We kind of talked about that on the retreat a little bit, because going from self-grandizing and to self-loathing. Yeah, and it's really the same thing. You know? I don't have to promote myself as something more than I am if I didn't think that I was less than I am. And look at the look at the confusion in that, and, it, it, and that goes right back to the Buddha describing his own awakening, being stuck in these in this feedback loop of wrong views bouncing off of. of an ignorant way of looking at the world. But it's because people don't know what's going on. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible to know what's going on at that time. It is. And we live in a world that, that constantly reinforces that view. You know? And, it's, it, that, and that, again, that's the, the Buddha on, upon his awakening. This is in the Loka Sutta. Excuse me. He, the first time he looked out on the world from an awakened point of view, he said, the world is a flame. And the world is not just the planet and the things going on on the planet, it's the people on the planet. 
the world is a plane. And it's just the same now as it was 2,600 years ago because of what the Buddha awakened to, that it's ignorance of four noble truths that leads to all manner of suffering. So we've taught this simple eightfold path to recognize and abandon those wrong views. That's the Dhamma. Wow. Thank you for a good class. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, just a quick announcement. I have um, posted all of the um, audio recordings from our retreat this past week, and they're all up on the website. There was no video because the Wi-Fi wasn't working up there. Um, and I just think, I think I got all the pictures up today, too, if anybody wants to take a look at that. But, uh, okay, we'll finish with... Um, with meta as we always do so again find your relaxed meditation posture and gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth and take a moment to become mindful of your in breath and your out breath and these are the buddha's words on meta from the karaniya meta sutta this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace let them be able and upright straightforward and gentle in speech humble and not conceited contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class tonight. Peace.